Coding is still necessary skill for software engineers, but at the same time, the coder's role is evolving from someone who just writes code to reviewing code. And this is extremely important, particularly in the new world of AI-driven software development. No, they won't be able to. For example, I would not completely trust AI to generate code. No, it's not just about prototyping. AI-generated code is moving into production. Um, there's no better time than now. Coding is still a necessary skill for software engineers, but at the same time, the coder's role is evolving from someone who just writes code to reviewing code. And this is extremely important, particularly in the new world of AI-driven software development. And how do you go about reviewing code if you've never written code yourself? So from a coder's point of view, the skills that are really relevant right now, uh, besides being able to write code, is also understanding uh, system thinking, for example. That's extremely critical. Being able to understand the fundamentals of how computing works, how operating systems work, how networking works, how graphics work, how hardware works, these are really critical. Uh, today. Being able to debug, how do you maintain software over a long period of time, that's extremely critical. Being able to collaborate with a larger team, uh, being able to review code written by others uh, as a part of a team, which is probably not written by others, but written by prompts generated by other users. How do you do that? These are very relevant skills in today's times. Collaboration, code review, how do you review code that was generated by prompts of your uh, colleagues? These are very relevant skills in today's times. Pretty much all of it. Even the problem of problem identification that the product team would typically focus on, that's made easier by AI now as well. At UB, uh, right from development until deployment, we are using AI uh, pretty heavily. Right from generating code snippets, boilerplate codes, model view controllers, could be regular expressions, sorting functions, anything that people would typically go to a place like Stack Overflow or Google, we are using AI for that. Uh, not just that, many of our repos today are 100% generated by AI. Typically for a certain class of problems as well. Uh, we use AI for code generation, for test case generation, for text execution. Uh, we use it for documentation, generation of readme files. We are using it for static analysis of code when there's a bug in the system. Uh, we are using it for refactoring, the way Martin Fowler had intended. We are also able to generate Docker files. We are able to generate GitHub actions, CI, CD, Terraform scripts. Pretty much the entire life cycle is uh, on AI today. But obviously based on the kind of problem that we're working on and the criticality of the problem, either we relegate 100% of it to AI or we have a significant amount of human intervention there as well. No, they won't be able to. Innovation requires creative thinking. It requires original thinking. It requires the ability to be able to bridge the technology solution with the real world context. It requires being able to experiment, being able to make trade-offs, which is one of the most important things when you're actually building software, is uh, you don't always have a clean solution. You need to be able to know what trade-offs to make and when. A lot of this comes from experience. Some of it think this is intuitive, but in fact, I think it's just your brain doing a bit of pattern matching with years of experience. And uh, at least at this point in time, AI is not able to solve any of these problems. Well, the answer to your question is both a yes and a no. At UB, we have put a lot of our production workloads, uh, a lot of our applications that we have built into production that have been completely built by AI. But you need to be a little bit more nuanced in the way you look at problems. There's a certain class of problems that you can put into production, even though it's completely generated by AI, and some which don't. For example, I would not completely trust AI to generate code uh, where, let's say, money is being touched. That's extremely critical. Wherever the application that you're working on uh, has a very high security requirement or is extremely critical in the real world in terms of touching lives of people, touching money. Um, I would not trust it completely to AI, but I would ensure that there's a human intervention involved. Uh, similarly, at the same time, there are certain problems that come with scale, which probably, as of today, the code generated by AI is not able to really solve, and I would require human intervention to kind of look at it to understand from an entire systems perspective in terms of how it's going to work. There are also problems that come with as you start rolling out your software into multiple geographies, multiple sets of users, multiple languages, and so on, which can be solved by AI, but obviously requires a certain way of framing the problem before you can kind of give it, hand it over to the system. But these are areas where we are still seeing humans uh, intervene in the problem. One of the things that I would particularly do if I had to put AI-generated code into production is ensure that we have the right guardrails, and this is extremely important, irrespective of whether the application is critical or not so critical. It could be, for example, making sure that you have robust type systems, making sure that you have 
a proper regression coverage, making sure that you have linting in your CI-CD pipelines. These are all areas where human oversight and expertise are crucial to ensure the stability of the system that we are rolling out into production. I don't think it's just about prototyping. As I just mentioned some time back, at UB, we have been using AI-generated code and moving it into production. If I look at all the repos that we have across UB today, the amount of system-generated code varies from 0 to 100 percent across many repos. But if I look at all the repos in which we are using AI-generated code, it's on an average it's about 56 percent of the code is generated by AI. As I said, the only systems where I do not allow AI-generated code to automatically uh, to move to production is where we are really touching money because that's extremely critical for our customers and we don't use AI-generated code over there. So no, it's not just about prototyping. AI-generated code is moving into production. A whole bunch of things. For example, the number one thing which I think is really important for any engineer in the future, uh, now and in the near future, is uh, multidisciplinary exposure or expertise. At the end of the day, for you to be a successful engineer, even if you just look at the field of computer science or technology, you need to understand how operating systems work, how networking stacks work, how do TCP IP protocols work, how does computer graphics work, uh, databases, machine learning. You need to be multidisciplinary because that's what kind of makes you a fully rounded engineer. Secondly, communication and problem solving is extremely critical. For you to be able to effectively wipe code, you need to be able to take a slightly complex problem and break it down into chunks that can actually be prompted to a system. This requires you to be a, a system level thinker of, of sorts and at the same time be able to effectively communicate. If you cannot effectively communicate, you cannot be good in the new world of wipe coding. Third, you have to be proactive, you have to be inquisitive. The number of tools and the pace of change of technology in this world of AI is extremely fast. For example, at UB, a uh, year back, we started, we rolled out chat GPT to all the users. We had an in-house GPT as well, which we rolled out to everyone. We ensured that everyone in the company had access to Copilot. We made sure everyone had access to Cursor. Now everyone has access to Windsurf. You need to be able to learn how to use the tools. Uh, what is MCP? How does it work? How do you build your own MCP servers? If you're not inquisitive, if you don't have the innate hacker mindset to be able to play around with things, and to be able to use them to solve the problems that you have, I don't think you're really going to be successful. Related to that, you need to be a continuous learner. And while continuous learning is important, it's also important to unlearn continuously because some of the things that you, we had taken for granted about the way things work in the past is not going to be applicable in the future. And it's not applicable even now, for example. One of the key challenges that I also see is the challenge of hiring. How do we change our interview process? How do we hire the next level of engineers? Because the kind of interviews, the kind of questions that we have been using all these days to filter and identify the right kind of candidates is not going to work. I think it's very important. This world is changing really, really fast. For example, at UB, we rolled out ChatGPT to all the users last year. Then came along GitHub Copilot, we rolled it out to all the users. Then Cursor came along, we made sure everyone had access to Cursor. Then Windsurf was rolled out to all the users as well. Now, if you don't get into this world quickly and start getting your hands dirty and being able to do some wipe coding yourself, uh, a year from now, you will not be able to catch up easily because it's not just about being able to use a tool, but it's also important to understand how we got there. That's the critical part. And I think if you're sitting around waiting, trying to figure out how this works, um, there's no better time than now. Mm -hmm.